All right, Matthew chapter 21. So this is part two of Matthew chapter 21. So we're going to pick up in verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 21. We, of course, went through verse 1 through 17 last Wednesday. So we're looking at themes of these chapters, right? So we're, we're looking at themes of these chapters. This is the second half of Matthew chapter 21. So the theme, I'm just going to give it away at the, the beginning here. But the theme of Matthew chapter 21 I'm going to show to you this evening is this theme of disobedience. And this theme of disobedience that Jesus is talking about um, in, in this chapter. And that's what we're going to look at this evening is this theme. And you'll see once again that even though this is the second half of Matthew chapter 21, this theme carries throughout the whole chapter. Okay, so look at Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 18. We've got a lot to get through tonight. We're going to go a lot of places in the Bible and look at a few different things. But look at verse number 18 where the Bible says, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth, for, henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? So first of all, this is like three plus years into Jesus' ministry. And, you know, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, how many miracles do these guys need to see? <laughs> you know, before they're, you know, they're just like, oh, wow, look what he did to the tree. I mean, he's been raising people from the dead, you know, healing the sick, making blind people see the whole thing. And they're just like, you know, he just killed a tree. And they're like, whoa, you know. But I guess, you know, a miracle is a miracle, right? So anyway, he, it's interesting that he looks at this tree. There's no fruit on this tree. And he just withers up the tree, right? He says, you've, you've, given, me, you've given no fruit to me. And just immediately, he takes away the, the tree's ability to, to make fruit anymore. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your head, especially as we go into this theme of disobedience in Matthew chapter 21. Look at verse number 20, or 21 in Matthew 21, and we'll continue. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which was done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and that be cast out into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Now, there's some application here. I mean, let's just talk about a little separate application here. Jesus here is saying that, you know, the faith that you have in your prayers being answered has a direct correlation on whether or not they will be answered. You see what he's saying? So he's saying that, you know, um, it, you could do this too, but he said, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, what's the next word? Believing. Okay? Whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So look, I mean, is verse 21, I mean, I always, you know, thought about verse 21 when I was, you know, look, I always believe the Bible. Even before I was saved, there's never a time in my life you could have asked me, is every word in the Bible true? I always would have said yes. Always. And I remember in verse 21, just reading this even as a kid, where it says, you know, hey, if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Look, it says, if ye have the faith that that will happen, you could move, you could literally move mountains if you have that faith. So, I mean, the bottom line is this, though. I used to always think about that. Like, man, could I, like, move a mountain with my faith? But the thing is, look, I mean, is, is verse 21 literal? Well, it certainly could be because no one would have that kind of faith. Okay? There's no way that anybody on planet Earth who's ever lived could look at a mountain and just pray for that mountain to be moved and just have absolute confidence that God would do it for them and not doubt even a little bit. Right? I mean, there's always that doubt that we have, that unbelief that we have in, you know, can God really do this for me? Can God really help me? You know, when I'm praying this prayer, God, are you really going to do that? I mean, is my heart really into this prayer? Like, I know that God will just do this for me. I know that God can just answer this prayer just like that. But look, that's what the Bible says that um, it says that, you know, I think we, we take for granted a lot in our prayers the whole belief on our side part. That's one thing that I, I know that I do, and I think that a lot of people do, just the faith that we need to have in God's ability to answer our prayers. Look, God can do whatever He wants. He can answer whatever prayer you have for God. Look, I mean, whether that's healing the sick, 
Like we're talking about whether it's fixing problems in your life, whether it's changing people's hearts that you want hearts to change. Look, do you believe God can do it when you pray for it is the question. That's the little mini application here. Okay, so when you're, when you're praying for something, whatever that thing is, you need to really think about where your faith is at during that prayer. And you say, why? Because it, it has a correlation to whether or not God will answer the prayer. That's why. Okay? So that, that's why the Bible says, whatsoever ye ask, believing. Believing. Okay? So look at Matthew 21 and verse number 23, and let's continue. The Bible says, And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, and likewise will I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he says, I first have a question for you. So they're asking, you know, they're constantly trying to catch Jesus, right? They're like, by what authority do you catch these things? You, you, are you doing these things? They're trying to get him to equate himself with God, say that he's God. And, you know, basically he says to them, he's like, I have a question for you. And he says to them, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned within themselves, or with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did ye then not believe him? Because he knows he's talking to people that did not recognize John the Baptist as a prophet, as someone who is speaking God's word. But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. So the people accepted, it's interesting, a lot of the people accepted John the Baptist, but the religious leaders did not, the Pharisees did not. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I, tell tell I you by what authority I do these things. So he's like, you're not going to answer my questions. I'm not going to answer yours. It's that simple, right? Now, there's, there's a decent application here, too. You know, not responding to a question or not responding when you don't know what to say is always a pretty decent option, actually, you know, when you think about it. Look, when you're not quite, when you're not quite sure what to say, not saying anything is always a pretty good choice. You know, just don't say anything. It's better to do that than be the idiot who always wants to be the first one that blurt out, to blurt out an answer, right? Because that guy is wrong a lot, unfortunately. Look, even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise, Proverbs says, right? So, you know, there, there's a, a secular version of that that says it's better for people to think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? So look, I mean, the point is, is that you simply just don't have to blurt out something that comes to your mind, right? I mean, it's just, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, James 1.19 says, Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So you're supposed to be slow to two things. We talked about being slow to wrath recently, but you're also supposed to be slow to speak in your life. That means you should just put some thought into things before you say it. And look, I use this all the time where it, I just used it today. I use this in my work life all the time. You're in some big meeting or whatever it is. You're in a big group of people and people are talking about stuff and you're just like, I, I know, it's not that I don't know the answer to things sometimes, right? I mean, sometimes I know the answer to what people are talking about, but I'm like, okay, maybe this guy will not want to hear that or this is going to make that go wrong. So in cases like that, I always just shut up. I always just don't say anything. And it typically works out pretty well. Okay, if you just don't speak, when you're not sure, don't speak. It's, it's that simple, okay? The Bible says here in James 1.19 that the only thing that we're so, supposed to be swift to do is to actually just listen, Amen. is to hear, right? So we should always be swift to hear. So be swift to listen. And you know what? You can be, you can be very, very picky about when you decide to say something. And Jesus was that way, right? So Jesus, in this case, was just like, you know what? It, I mean, he did it in a clever way, which he always does things in a clever way, but basically he's just like, you know what, I know that there's no right answer right now. I mean, he knew what the right answer was, but he's like, I know that there's no way to not get trapped by these guys in this thing right now. I'm just not going to say anything. And that's what he did. And it, it, was, it was good. Now let's look at verse number 28. Let's move on. That was just another aside, just another little application. Matthew 21, look at verse 28. 
Let's look at some, um, this idea of obedience now and disobedience. And we'll start to see this theme pop up when Jesus starts giving some more parables. Look at verse 28 where it says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. So here's this kid. He's like, hey, go to work in the field. And the kid's like, no. But then like, you know, a few minutes or hours later, whatever, he actually just goes and he, he's obedient, right? But then look at verse 30. Then came he to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So this kid says to, you know, his, the father, he's like, yeah, okay, I'll go. No problem. And then he just doesn't go, right? He just doesn't go. And then the Bible says in 30, verse 31, whether of them twain did the will of his father. It says, which one did best for his father? And they said unto him, the first. Jesus say unto them, verily I say unto, unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. So two sons. One says he won't go, but look, at least he was honest. Right? At least he was honest and says, you know, I don't want to go. He's like, I don't want to go to the vineyard. He was disobedient, but he was honest. Right? He was honest with a conscience, if you think about it that way. Because eventually this first son, he gets it right. And he actually goes. The other son is just a liar. Right? The other son is just a straight up liar. He's just a people pleaser. Right? He just wants to, he wants to get the praise of saying to his father, yeah, I'll go. I'm the good son. Everybody can hear him say it, you know, that he's being all obedient to his father. And then he just doesn't go, right? When nobody's looking, he just doesn't go. So he's just, he's out there. He wants the credit. He wants the glory. He wants the people to think that he's this righteous son, right? But he just, he's the most disobedient. And he's a liar. He's dishonest, right? But look, the father is never fooled. Okay, the father is never fooled. So look, Jesus must have been super irritated with the Pharisees, especially when you read this chapter. Okay, I mean, here are these Pharisees. I mean, this is who he's talking about. They're super spiritual. They have to wear all these garments with the borders enlarged. And they're out there and they're just these spirit. They're, they're doing everything to just be seen of men. Period. They talk the talk, yet they were complete frauds these guys. Now, the publicans and the harlots, on the other hand, you know, look, at least they believed him once he was there. Right? I mean, at least, you know, they, they came to the correct conclusion, even though they certainly didn't start out correctly. Right? Like that first son. They didn't start out with the right answer, but these Pharisees, they were disobedient to the end. Look at verse 32. And Jesus even explains it even further. He says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. So here he's saying, look, the publicans and the harlots, he's explaining the parable, they believed John the Baptist. He's like, you believed him not. And then it gets even worse. He says, and when ye had seen it, seen what? When ye had seen all the publicans and the harlots accept John's words, and accept John as a prophet, what did you do? You repented not afterward. They had two chances, right, in that one verse. In verse 32, that you might believe him. So look, they had, Jesus came, and they didn't accept him. And then they saw all these people believe on him, and they still didn't accept him. You see? They remained disobedient at that point. I mean, and, I mean we know from reading the Bible that this wasn't the only time. I mean, it was just time after time after time that they were just rejecting and rejecting and being disobedient, being disobedient towards Jesus, right? So look, I mean, Jesus is irritated at this point. Jesus is done with these people. Look at Matthew 21, 33. Here another parable. He explains even further. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and, servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So here's this guy. He, he, he rents out his, 
his uh, vineyard, goes into a far country, and he wants to go and get the profits from the thing, and he sends servants, and the people that are running the vineyard for him are just beating his servants as they come to collect what is his. It's that simple. It's, I mean, he was going to get his own property. Look at Hebrews 11 and verse number 32. The Bible here is talking about um, the prophets. And it says in verse 32, What and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and of Samson and Jephthah and David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of the weaknesses, were, weakness was made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. It sounds kind of like these servants that went back to the, you know, to, to the vineyard to collect for their, their master. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Look, these were the early servants right here. These were the servants that Jesus is talking about in this parable that went back to the vineyard that were beaten and tortured and stoned and all these things. And then the, the guy in the parable says, all right, I'm going to send my son now. He's like, I'm not going to send my servants anymore. So all these, pro you know, he's, he's, he's picturing the prophets here that we're reading about in Hebrews chapter 11. Now look at verse number 37 of Matthew 21. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husband saw the, husbandmen saw the son, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. So look, this right here shows you really one of the main reasons why the Pharisees are trying to kill Jesus. Right here. It's because they wanted to seize on his inheritance. Look, they were jealous of him. The, the spiritual kingdom at that time, they're like, hey, that's our kingdom. That's, you know, we're the spiritual ones here. You know, we're the leaders of this religion here. Whatever they had turned, you know, the religion of the Bible into, they're like, we're the leaders of this here, and this guy's coming in, and he's claiming this spiritual inheritance. Look, it was his inheritance. Amen. And he was taking it from people who had stolen it, basically. Right. All right? So, look, they were jealous of him. They wanted the spiritual kingdom to be theirs. Look at verse 39. And they caught him, and they cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Then Jesus says, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? So this is kind of like one of those simplified, broken down stories that he asks, you know, that he tells. And kind of like Nathan talking about, you know, the sheep to David. Just really makes him just realize what's really happening. Open your eyes a little bit. But look at Romans chapter 3 and verse number 2. So look. What will he do unto the husbandmen? Now, who are these husbandmen that he's talking about? The husbandmen are, are the Jews. I mean, he's not really just talking about the Pharisees here. He's talking about who was, you know, the kingdom given to. Who was the vineyard given to here? I mean, it was the Jews. They were, they were the chosen people. So look, look at Romans chapter 3 and verse number 1 where the Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly. So he's like, there's a lot of advantages, he said. Mainly, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So the biggest advantage that the Jews had, look, the Jews had all kinds of advantage. They, were, they had the truth from the beginning. God led them with all these different leaders and all these different chosen, you know, from the judges to, you know, even the good kings that were leading them. Look, they had all these godly influences in their life, but mainly they had the Word of God is what they had. All right? So that, these, were the, these were the husbandmen. Look at verse 41 of Matthew 21. And they say unto him, Look, this is the Pharisees answering now. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men 
and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen. Look, this isn't Jesus that said this. This is them answering, which will render him the fruits of their seasons. Look, who are the other husbandmen? These are the Gentiles that the gospel is going to. Okay? Go to, um, we're going to skip ahead and go to verse 43 real quickly, just because there's a, I want to finish this theme, and then we're going to go back to the main theme. So look at verse 43, and Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. So he tells them, he's like, look, they're like, he's, like, he's going to destroy those wicked men. And he's going to give it, I mean, he would obviously give his vineyard to somebody who would not do all those nasty, horrible things. Right? And then he says, thou art the man. Just like Nathan said to David. Right? The na he's like, the nation will be taken from you. He said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. You see the fig tree now? You see how he goes to the fig tree and the fig tree? You see how this all fits together into disobedience? When he goes to the fig tree and he's like, I want fruit from you, tree. Nothing done. Just like that. And the disciples were like, man, that happened fast. Well, it just happened to the Jews right here. It just happened to them right here. So we started with the actual picture of the fig tree and Jesus just took it away from them right here. Okay? Now look, I mean, turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And look at verse number 25. I mean, look, this isn't a, this isn't a, a hidden theme in the Bible. It, it's, it's huge all over the place. In Roman, and so I'm not going to, I know that we already know this, so I'm not going to go too deep into this. But let me just show you in Romans chapter 9, verse 25. I know we've already studied this, but it says, As he said also in Osi, that's Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, the Gentiles, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there they should be called the children of the living God. So we're talking about the kingdom being removed from the unbelieving Jews and being, you know, I mean, look, there's a remnant. There's a remnant. I mean, there's a remnant. Some Jews believed. I mean, it's in the Bible all over the place. Some Jews believed, but the majority of the mainstream Jewish Leaders, religion did not accept Jesus, and it was taken from them, and it was given to the Gentiles. And there's, look, there's a, any Jew that believes is going to be saved just like anybody else. Amen. I mean, the Bible says, you know, the, the natural branch can obviously be grafted back in pretty easily, you know. I mean, it's, it's the natural branch, right? Now, go back to, so that's the theme that Jesus is getting at in those two parables. But go back to verse number 42 now. Verse number 42. Because it gets worse. I mean, Jesus really gets... He really turns it up now. Look at verse 42. And Jesus said unto them, Did ye not ever read in the Scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's, of course, quoting Isaiah 53 here, where he says, you know, the same, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. So I want to look at this idea. Turn to Psalm 118 of this stone. And I know a lot of you, you know, have seen, you know, Jesus as the cornerstone and all this. So we're going to look at that first. But there's actually two types of stones here, or two uses for the stone in this chapter that we're going to look at. Okay? Now the stone, look at verse, Psalm 118. Psalm 118, look at verse 22. Psalm 118, verse number 22, where the Bible says, The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Very similar to uh, verse number 42. Turn to Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at a bunch of verses on this because I want to just really get it, you know, driven in that, you know, Jesus is this stone. Jesus is this headstone of the corner or cornerstone. Look at Acts 4 and verse 11. Acts 4 and verse 11. The Bible says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. So there's this stone that was rejected, and it became the head of the corner. All right? If look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And verse number 20. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 20, And are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So here's Jesus once again, this chief cornerstone that the entire building, of course, you know, turn to Isaiah 28. The entire building, of course, is built around the cornerstone. I mean, this Cornerstones today are more symbolic and like decorative, but at Cornerstones actually had a purpose back in building before there was all these different tools and measurement devices. I mean, basically, you had a cornerstone and you had a you built a foundation, you set a cornerstone, and every other stone for that building was built off of that cornerstone in reference to that stone. So every stone was lined up as with that cornerstone as a reference point, okay? So if you see, you know, I mean, it, it, it determined everything about the building. It determined which way the building was facing. It determined how straight all the walls were. It determined the orientation exactly of the building. The cornerstone was everything, all right? Look at Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Look at Isaiah 28, 16. The Bible says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So here we see that once again, the gospel is in Isaiah 28. Right? He that believeth. I mean, so the gospel was always in the Old Testament. They understood it just like we understand it today. Go back to Matthew 21 and verse 43. Matthew 21 and verse 43. 44. I'm sorry, we already looked at 43. But, so we see Jesus as this cornerstone, all right? But there's another purpose for the stone. There's another purpose laid out here for the stone that is Jesus, all right? One, so Jesus is this rock. He's this stone. One purpose is to be this cornerstone. For them that what? Them that believe. Okay? He's our cornerstone. He's our reference. He's our guide. But look at verse number 44 where it says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Whoa! We're not, now we're not building things anymore. Now we're breaking stuff. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Wow! That's the opposite of building the building right there. Right? Grinding stuff to powder. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. So we see there's this cornerstone. One, I mean, one of the one of the type, one of the stones, Jesus is both stones. One, one of the uses for the stone is to build, is to be a reference, is to be a foundation. And the other is to grind to powder. There's more to this stone than building, folks. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 6. Look at verse number 6 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone. There it is. Elect, precious. And he that... What, what goes with the cornerstone? He that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So we see that the cornerstone is for him that believeth on him. In verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. There it is. The stone which the builders disallowed. Sound familiar? The same is made the head of the corner. So we see this, this same wording again. That, yeah, okay, he's the head of the corner, but the builders disallowed him. Now we're going to get some more detail on what happens here in verse number 8. And it says, now, it says, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble, what? Stumble what? at the word being what? Disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. They were appointed. Who, what, what was the advantage of the Jew? They were appointed the word. Were they obedient to the word? They were disobedient to the word. So the cornerstone became a stumbling stone to them. It became a rock of offense to them. But wait, there's more. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. It gets way worse than just a stone of stumbling. Turn to Daniel chapter 2 and look at verse number 31. So, I mean, so much in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2 talking about the cornerstone to them that believeth on him. 
You, it's a cornerstone. If you believe, I mean, that's what I want, a cornerstone, a foundation, right? That can't be moved. But to others, uh, to the disobedient, to the disobedient, where one, at, which stumble at the word. You see, they stumbled, at, they had the word and they stumbled at it. They were disobedient, whereunto they were also, also they were appointed. They were given the, the oracles of God. They were given the word and they were disobedient to it. That's it. And now this is the type of stone that they're going to be dealing with. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. This is where Daniel is asked to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar, he had this dream, and remember, he, he, he gets all the magicians and the wise men, he's like, hey, he's like, I need you to interpret my dream. And they're like, no problem, man, just tell us what the dream was. And he's like, no, you tell me the dream and the interpretation. They're like, ah! They're like, what? We can't do that trick. So here comes Daniel. Look at verse 31 of Daniel. And he prays to God, and God shows Daniel the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel gives the interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says in verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. He's telling the king what he saw. Talk about going out on a limb, right? <laughs> I'm going to tell you what you dreamed last night, buddy. I mean, talk about faith. Talk about faith when you stand in front of the most powerful man on planet Earth, and you're just like, here's what you saw in your dream last night, buddy. Complete faith. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms were of silver. His belly and his thighs were of brass. So the head was gold. The, the arms and the chest were silver. The belly was, and thighs were brass. And he had legs of iron. And his feet, part of iron and part clay. So his feet and the toes were iron and clay mixed together. Thou sawest till, now look at verse 34. Thou sawest till, he's saying you also saw. That's what he's saying, okay? Till that a stone was cut out without hands. Hmm. Now we have a stone here. Which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Like what? Like powder? And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof to the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. He's saying, you are the head of gold, the, the king of the Babylonian empire. And, where, and after this shall arise thee another kingdom inferior to thee. This is the silver, the silver arms and the silver chest. And another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, and part of the iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay." And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. And there, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's like, ah! It's like, what? So look, he basically tells them that the golden head is you, Babylon. We know, of course, because we're in the future now. We know that you know the silver arms and chest is the Persian Empire that came right after the Babylonian Empire. Look, Daniel even saw that empire. 
So Daniel saw two of these empires. The brass was the Grecian Empire of Alexander the Great. These are empires that basically ruled the entire world at one time. Iron legs, this was the Roman Empire, the Iron Empire. And the toes is this empire of the future that will exist when Jesus comes to bring in the millennial reign. But the bottom line is this. All, and look at verse 34 and in verse 45. All of these empires in the entire history of the world are just crushed to pieces by the stone. They are crushed to pieces. Verse 44, and then the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That's God's kingdom. So look, Jesus is the rock of salvation. He is the cornerstone for all those who believe. But those who do not he is this immovable stumbling stone and a rock that break in pieces all that are in disobedience. It's that simple. Right. So he is a rock, but he's either a cornerstone or he's going to smash you to powder. It's, it's really, that's the only two choices. Okay, all without belief will be smashed to pieces by this rock. Amen. Look at verse 45 of Matthew chapter 21. And the Bible says, And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Ah! <laughs> it's like, again. Look at verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. The people did. So look. I mean, the application of this, it, this disobedience here, is, is like Jesus' best friend or worst enemy. Pick one. Right? I mean, you choose. I mean, these two types of stones, a cornerstone, you know, a stone used for the orientation of a foundation in which all other stones are in reference to. Turn to John chapter 14. A verse that I'm sure you've all heard, you know, a thousand times. But turn to John chapter 14 and look at verse number 6. I mean, this... This dichotomy is found in John 14, 6. And in John 14, 6, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everybody loves that part, right? Everybody loves that part. Like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the part that's written on bumper stickers, written on church walls, written everywhere. But look at the next part. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, but I'm the only way. That's it. He's like, you know, the stone that smote the image, which was all men that ever lived, basically, was Jesus. The, the rock that crushed it, you know, into pieces was Jesus. And it says in verse 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whosoever it shall fall, it'll grind him to powder. That's Jesus. You know, that, I mean, that... That's the other choice. That's the other choice. Like, so all these people that just don't care, that are just indifferent, that, you know, look, they should because you better be on the right side of this Jesus thing. Amen. You know, and, and all these people painting Jesus as this, you know, you know, sheep shepherd and all these stupid paintings that aren't real, Amen. you know, they're doing a disservice to everybody that's ever lived that ever looks at those things, because look, you, it's, it's, there's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. You better be on the right side. You say, you know, that's mean. That's not fair. Right? But okay, let's explore. Let's look at your life. Let's look at everyone's life real quickly. Let's just put some logic to it. Right? So God created everyone. Right? It starts there. Everybody got life. Right? Everybody that's ever existed got life. Without God, we aren't even here. Right? We owe him our very existence. I, I don't think you know, most people would disagree with that. Then he gives you, uh, you know, this conscience, this law written in your heart, so you'll actually seek him. You'll actually, he actually gives you kind of like this magnet that draws you to him, like built in with you. So he kind of puts a magnet inside you that draws you to want to know more about him and find out what's going on. But look, we still have this problem, right? So we have this life that we've been given for free. We have this conscience we've been given for free. We have this draw towards God. We still have this problem. We've all sinned against a holy God. 
I mean, that's a problem. It's the problem, right? So he goes further, right? He goes further. He steps in, right? He sees that we've sinned against a holy God. He steps in and he provides a path out of trouble for us. And it's not like he comes in and he writes a check. He, like, does it himself. He, like, has, like, his own be only begotten son, like, tortured and, and killed and, like, thrown into hell, like, for our, for us, to get us out of our own mess, right? So he gave us life. He gave us a conscience that draws us towards God all for free. He gives us a path out of our, then we make all these mistakes. Then he gives us a path out of those mistakes through his own pain and suffering. And we, we reject, and, and, and you're going to reject that? You're going to reject that? I mean, think about giving somebody a gift that cost you a hundred bucks. And then think about giving somebody a gift that cost you like one of your children. And they just say, they just throw it in your face. And they're like, no thanks. Look, then it's powder time is the bottom line. And it's totally fair. Because it wasn't fair that you had all those chances in the first place, that you were given a life in the first place. So that's why Jesus is your best friend or your worst enemy. I mean, at the end of everyone's life on this earth, when you know, they're standing in front of God, it, Jesus is going to be your best friend or your worst enemy. You're either going to really want to see him or you're really, really not going to want to see him. You're going to be like, oh, man. It's powder time. I mean, you, it, when you look at it this way, I mean, when you just look at the top-level picture, that's what I was trying to give you, just the top-level picture of what every single person has received from God, whether they accept Him or not. When you look at it that way, I mean, it's not hard to see how God doesn't have much of a gray zone. Amen. Like, He doesn't have one. Period. Amen. You're either with me or against me. Right. He created you. He gave you everything. He offers more. He offers you life, salvation, eternal life. It's not fair because you didn't deserve any of it. None of us did. Even, even though those of us that are saved, which hopefully it's everyone in this room, but look, we didn't deserve any of that. So look, it's all about the proper perspective, folks. So this chapter is all about disobedience. It's all about disobedience. From, from Jesus going into the temple and just kicking them out for being disobedient with the, his house. Right? He's like, look, you've been disobedient with how I wanted you to handle my house. And he just whips them out of there. And, and violently throws them out to the fig tree, to the parables of the two sons. You know, who was really disobedient? Right? The, the lying son that was just a liar just to be seen of men and, and was just disobedient the whole time to the, the vineyard and the disobedient servants of the vineyard. Look, he's just talking about the disobedience of the Jews throughout this whole chapter. And he's, he's talking about what it's going to cost people who hold on to that disobedience to the end. Matthew chapter 21. Which stone... Um, do you want Jesus to be for you, is the question. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.